Today we're going to be talking with Senator Yana Martin regarding a number of topics. Including guaranteed basic income. Yes. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Senator Martin. Uh, hello. Hi, is this Ed Campry? Yes, is this Senator Yona? Yes, it's, uh, it's my last name's Martin, so Yana Martin. Oh, Yana Martin, my apologies. Well, first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you um, for... I'd like to thank you for uh, calling. Uh, we're just going to talk about a couple of questions. I have my friend uh, Kellen here, and uh, he's going to ask a couple of questions as well. And basically, we're just doing a podcast, uh, so it's just going to be published on YouTube. Is this uh, a podcast that the two of you host? Uh, yeah, it's just me and uh, my friend Kellen. It's like a thing we just started recently. Oh, wow. Good for you. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm from Miss Hutchinson's class. We had that Zoom meeting. Um, yes. I mean, I recognize your voice even. And I think you were one of the people that asked the question, right? Yes. I was the one who asked about UBI and I raised my hand the second time because I needed <laughs> another question. Yeah. <laughs> well, good for you. I mean, you guys, you have a... Um, just even in your energy and your voice, I can just tell that you're very passionate about what you're doing. So it's great that, you know, at your age and at whatever age, if you're taking the initiative to talk about these things, it's it's really uh, good for you. I, I applaud the initiative that you've taken. How long have you guys have had this podcast? Um, we started July 1st. Um, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, so... We've just talked. We've talked about many things, you know, religion, UBI, and uh, a bunch of other topics. Okay. Well, so both of you are currently in high school still, right? Grade twelve. Uh no, I'm in uh, grade eleven. Um, and my oh, friend Kellen 11. has is in uh, university. Okay. Alrighty, my friend Kellen will ask the first question. Hello, Senator Martin. We had heard that the Liberal Party um, had guaranteed basic income as a, as a top priority. Um, and we were just wondering if it was to be implemented, what it would look like, um, and sort of who would get it, it, if you know anything about the sort of the plan for that. So I'm not sure if this is uh, the current government's top priority. I know it's something that the NDP have talked about, and it's a topic that has come up in the Senate as well. But, um, you know, a universal basic income, a guaranteed income is something that theoretically, you know, sounds really, you know, good. It would help everyone, especially those, uh, you know, that would need it the most financially, of course. But, um, I just question the sustainability of something that, you know, anytime we take something on nationally, there's quite a cost. And uh, already, you know, this year in 2020, because of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, I guess what the government has put in place, these emergency programs, um, it they, they were meant to be temporary. They were meant to help people get through this most difficult time but if this were like the you know the weekly five hundred dollar so two thousand dollars a month the, the CERB right the yes. emergency relief benefit which is sort of like a universal basic income that if we were to go forward with it but to be able to provide um, something universal to Canadians it would come at quite a cost and we're already in quite a deficit situation already the national debt has risen um, exponentially I think it's probably at one of the highest levels uh, since um, you know for as long as we can remember so it just isn't sustainable we've had that confirmed by the parliamentary budget officer by economists that these are all temporary measures but to sort of guarantee something long term um, I'm not sure if like we're in a position to do that as a country but what we can do is have other programs that will help those that are most vulnerable and in need yeah I definitely I definitely agree with that um, that statement of yours um, you know because I understand it's it's a huge proposal and to sustain something of this, you know, I guess, you know, this idea or, you know, UBI in general would be very difficult. And uh, 
like what programs do we have right now that are that are helping people right now and like would they be better um than ubi or is the ubi uh just better in general because of the uh topics or uh, not topics sorry the uh the programs that i would implement well i mean we have to look at it this way too is it's all coming from taxpayer uh, taxes that that canadians would pay the government would be you know giving these benefits uh, to canadians but in order to, to do that, you have to tax more. Um, we, have a, we have an aging population, so that means the workforce. And I think that the millennials and the, the younger generation, um, I'm pretty sure we have a bit of a declining birth rate. So we know that in the future, we have to have immigrants to even have enough of the labor force to, to be able to have people work in all sectors. So we have sort of the combination of things that make um, any sort of guaranteed income for a long term, very, very challenging. So what I would say is we know that, you know, seniors, um, we, we provide for seniors, we provide provide, provide for people uh, in, in with low income bracket, but uh, looking at something that's, uh, you know, universal and long term, it's just, it just would be very unrealistic for Canada. So as a government, as a country, we do have to take care of the most vulnerable. But um, what we're doing now this year with the, the CERB, with an extended, you know, uh, an expanded EI program that we're currently debating a bill, C4. And I think it's going to add about $60 billion in deficit spending to this year. We already have almost, you know, 300,000, 300 million, sorry, sorry, $300 billion um, in debt already, over $300 wow. billion. So we're talking you know, not, not millions, but billions. So there's a lot of deficit spending already. We just cannot sustain this for a long period of time. Okay. That is a fact. It has to be temporary. Thank okay. You for the answer. Thank you for that answer. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I just have another follow up for that question. Um. You know, you mentioned that we're already in debt of three hundred billion dollars, which is uh huge. Um. I just. I'm just surprised and baffled by that number. But um. You know what would what would the cost of UBI, or even guaranteed basic income even be? Well, I don't know. It's hard to give you like a, a, a number, but it's we're talking in the billions again. But uh, just in what we're doing for the next uh, year, um, we are extending the the sort of emergency um, benefit program that people will be receiving approximately two thousand dollars a month that's already happened in the last six months so to extend it for another year to provide um you know payment to those who who can't work because they have uh you know children under 12 who are affected by daycare or school so anything covid related so just the price tag of of that is in the tens of billions. So wow. we're talking, it's a lot of money. That's just for one year. So imagine if we had to sustain that every year. So if you were to extend these government supported programs, which right now is going to all, you know, millions of people across Canada. So on one hand, yes, we have to help the Canadians now. These are very unprecedented, unprecedented times, but the spending has to be, you know, short term, not you know, multi-year because we just can't sustain that as a country. All right. Thank you for your answer once again. Uh, Kellen? Um, Senator Martin, I had uh, one other concern, and I was wondering uh, if, um, if critical race training was going, to be, um, was going to be banned in Canada in the way that Donald Trump is trying to ban it in the United States. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean by critical race training. Um, for can example, just, uh, clarify a little bit. Okay, for example, um, say implicit by um, implicit bias retraining. Hmm. That, that, that's. I know that uh, racial so racial sensitivity training is what you're talking about. Sure. Yes. Like sensitive. Well, I think in Canada, this is something. You know, we talk about cultural sensitivity. 
Yeah. We, that's the phrase that we use. And that's simply, you know, in government institutions or in, in organizations that if you're dealing with a diverse population, we, we, we often talk about, you know, getting sensitivity training, whether it's regarding, you know, ethnocultural issues and cultural norms and differences and traditions so that we are sensitive to one another. So, I mean, in Canada, we do this. We have been doing this for, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a former educator. So as teachers, we are very sensitive about the other, right? different people of different ethno-cultural backgrounds and um, whether it's in the RCMP or uh, in, in, in the federal um, government, those types of uh, public service jobs, I think we, as Canadians, um, we value, you know, the, the, these, the kind of training that we do to just ensure that we're very, you know, open-minded and culturally sensitive to, to those that we're working with. That that makes Canada such a good country, right? I so agree. This, yes. This is like the American. The, what's happening in the U.S. and Canada? They are quite different. Our discussions are very different. So, um, in terms of critical race training, I think it's a phrase that we don't use up in Canada. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So this is not a topic that we have discussed or debated or anything like that. But we talk about, you know, cultural sensitivity and, and those types of phrases. Interesting. What other questions do you have, Kellen? <laughs> uh, that pretty much covers it. Yeah, that does. Um, yeah, like I know, I know the budgets are uh, really, really, uh, I guess, off right now because we're in debt. But what's the yearly budget of Canada? Like, I, I believe it's around three hundred and sixty-two billion, or what is it? You know, I haven't seen a budget in quite a while from this government. It's been all COVID related, so um, I I can't answer that right now. I'd have to look at I had to have to look at the foreign book. <laughs> this year has been so unprecedented. You know, where our numbers are skewed. Yeah, I know. It's I totally. It's a lot of deficit right now. Yeah, everything. I, I like um, from you know giving Serb out to citizens. Um, I have another question. Let's just talk about Serb in general. Uh, for the people who are you know uh, you know taking Serb but actually probably don't qualify for those for those uh, for that payment of two thousand uh, dollars, how is the fraud department or I guess uh, whoever does that gonna? determine and get that money back are there going to be fines or what, what are we looking at what's the plan that's a very good question and we know that those cases have been in the hundreds of thousands right so there's a lot of cases so it's not to say canadians are purposely defrauding government or there's it's a rampant uh, um, activity but we do know and we've heard of cases, anecdotal examples of people who shouldn't be collecting who are, and some who have received more than one check, some, you know, more than two checks. So we know it's happening. We've, we've heard about it. So how it, this will be retrieved is a very good question. I, it's going to be difficult, I think, to retrieve, um, I'd say, I, I say most of it, but I, I can't say for sure. How successful government will be but if uh, these are a lot of people have lost their jobs you know checks have just been flying out the door very, yeah. very, quick, very easily and that's why there was room for such fraud so I think those in the next uh, set of um, government relief payments like some consideration have been made to ensure that you know we can minimize the fraud but at the same time a lot has already happened so that is a concern for us and I think it'll be difficult yeah no I definitely think Canada did an amazing job an amazing job uh, better than any country in my opinion um, you know in supporting people financially and two thousand dollars was just amazing but you know when when we talk about you know uh, fraud fraud claims or anything like that and people who you know needed that money but could didn't qualify um, and you know 
like how would that work? Like let's say somebody who was poverty strucken and did not qualify for CERB, uh, how would like what would the government do in those situations? Will there be appeals, or how is it going to work for uh, people who did not fit those uh, qualifications or requirements? Um, will they be given their money back in a uh, in a in a in a financial way, or how is that going to work? Well, I think people who are most destitute, I mean, government can't be everywhere. So we do have um, some, like we have the charitable sector that in every city, I would think, in, in every region of Canada, there are, there's some churches, there are charitable organizations, there's um, emergency housing, like there's all those types of activities and organizations where we wherever we go. So thank goodness for... Um, civil society and uh, you know the charitable sector but in terms of people who um, you know haven't qualified these are there are gaps and we we know that um, you know self-employed people people with small businesses uh, some of them just wouldn't weren't able to access loans and, and there have been major gaps and we know that but you know the other issue this is something um, it's, it's not answering your this question but to sort of look at there was those fraudulent um, activity, but the other problem has been that uh, because people have, have been receiving these payments from government, and they there was that there was an incentive to go back to work. That if they earned too much, they would lose the government pay, payment, and therefore it people would have more money in their pockets by not working. So there was a de incentivization to not get back to work. So I've heard lots of businesses who say they just can't get people to work. So that has been another issue this past year too. So hopefully, um, you know, as we will get through the second, uh, you know, phase right now with uh, the, the rise in some of the numbers that everyone will continue to work hard. We can, you know, maintain the numbers and we ha we do have an extension of these programs. It's a, it's for about a year and we hope that within this year we can continue to incentivize and get people back to work as well at the same time as help those who need help so that we can get back to some sort of normalcy. Otherwise, we can't sustain these payments. Yeah. It's... Like there is a fiscal cliff, right? There's a point where uh, we just can't do it. There isn't, I mean, you just can't print money, right? Yeah. You can't, you have to tax, you have, there's diff only a few ways that government can have money to do these programs. So we have to get people back to work. So hopefully this is what we can all work towards. Thank you. Thank you for that answer once again. And thank you very much for your time, Senator Martin. Do you have any more questions, oh. Kellen? I do not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, again, I applaud both of you for taking this initiative, and hopefully you continue to have these conversations and think about the Canada that you want to see in the immediate future and in your future when you guys become the leaders. <laughs> well, I... Mean, I... That's the whole point. Because all this debt is burdening your generation and future generations. So that's what I sleep about actually yeah thank you thank Absolutely. you uh for your time and i just have one request for you this is uh <laughs> well i have a lot of politicians in my local area that follow me on instagram um i was just yeah. wondering if you could follow me too <laughs> i will do that so do you um you can reach out to me on instagram i have a page okay and uh, maybe if you follow i'll follow you back all right so i is just it under, is it under your name um, yeah, it's under my name. It's Akum underscore one, two, three, four, five. I don't know if you want to write it down or. <laughs> okay, no, I, I'll go to my Instagram after I end this call, actually. Alrighty, perfect. Um, yeah, I just, I just, uh, you know, Sukh Thaliwal, my local M uh, MP. Yes. He follows me, Randeep Sarai. So I'm just getting a lot of political uh, connections right now, to be honest. It's, well, a, it's maybe amazing. That's a sign of things to come. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you a direct message and, uh, we can, uh, I'll just be thankful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I look forward to uh, following your activities and good luck with everything. G yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was a good podcast, my friend. Uh, I, uh, definitely didn't know that. I could be so enriched with compassion by talking to a compassionate leader. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah.
How'd you like it? I did like it. I liked it quite a lot. Yeah, it was a interesting, rather amusing uh, part to, or segment to our yeah segment, I guess, to our podcast. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Yana Martin, for being on our podcast. It truly means a lot to me and my friend Callan. Indeed, we appreciate it very much. Thank you for coming on and having the conversation with mm-hmm. us. Really appreciate it. And thank you to our viewers for watching the Kellen Howard podcast. Thanks Subscribe. for watching. Subscribe. Like and share. Hit the like button. <laughs> and thank you once again. <laughs>